Now, in your ancient study of universal cosmogony, your Hindus followed this concept almost exactly. And the Greeks, apparently, probably from contact with Asia, did at an early time arrive at a remarkably similar conclusion. And that is that in the cooling or crystallizing of the body of the earth, due to the slower motions at the poles, less friction against atmosphere, that your crystallization areas first appeared at the poles to form what they referred to in India as the crowns of the earth mother, magnificent helmet or diadem, which appeared to crown the great earth parent. These crowns, which we now regard to regard as polar areas, are now to us only known as ice fields. But we must realize that although a submarine has gone under this area to prove that there is no actual land there, we must realize that the submarine is going under the magnetic pole, not the true pole that at a long period of time ago, what Camille Flammarion, the great French astronomer, referred to as the 13 motions of the Earth, that the Earth has many motions, and one of these motions is the gradual separation of the true pole and the magnetic pole due to a third Earth motion, and that this means that only in so many billions of years will these two poles re-coincide. Consequently, the area which was originally the polar cap is now in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. And what we call now the pole is the magnetic pole, by which, we, which we discover only by means of the magnetic needle. Thus, do not uh, mistake the idea that the original polar area was not a land area. It was. And among all Asian, ancient people, Asiatic and otherwise, this mysterious land area, which is now known as the Desert of Shamal, or Gobi, and where Roy Chapman Andrews so sincerely believed he was going to find the first vestiges of life upon the planet, that this area was originally the polar continent, and that all other things being equal, the manifestation of life, not the creation of it, but the manifestation of life, would first begin in those areas where it could be first sustained, uh, where you still had tremendous volcanic flux, where you had a hopelessly insecure area, still tremendously influenced by the tremendous uh, contact of fire and vapor until you had what was called to the ancients this mystery of the fire mist uh, covering the entire earth that the combustion and the atmosphere formed a most non-congenial atmosphere for the development of anything therefore it is where this began to clear where form and structure began to emerge the free spores striking the planet could have found survival. Otherwise, they could not have survived. Those that struck in other areas, if they did, did not survive. But all that was necessary in connection with this problem was that a few should survive, as in the case of the human sperm, of which only one actually breaks through to fecundate the cell. This situation means that according to the ancient beliefs that life as we know it began on the Polarian continents as they were anciently called. That is, continents composed of the polar caps. And that of these, the North Polar Cap was the one most favored and first supplying the magnetic field for it was here that the earth was directly connected with the sun. So the ancients held it to be a truth that life appearing on the earth first appeared in the Polarian zone, or what one would have called originally the geographical pole of the earth, North Pole, and began to function in a completely isolated area surrounded by chaos, 
surrounded by a condition that required millions of years of further development uh, to make habitable by life as we know it. That other lives, according to legend, could have existed in the fire mist, we also are told. But that these lives, in turn, departed and did not return. That after the fire mist cleared, they could no longer endure and went on to other atmospheres or environments or dimensions of time and space which we may sometime also explore. But the Polarian development resulted in the gradual creeping southward of habitable land area. Perhaps in the beginning extending itself almost like uh, fingers down into the combustion. Little by little, the combustion area moved southward, or rather perhaps was overcast by a solid surface moving southward, until the fires of Vulcan were encased and enclosed, and only the great volcanic vents of ancient legend remained. Thus this area, which was not snowbound then, or anything of that nature, represented an ancient zone of life. How long it was before this area was snowbound, we do not know. But assuming the approximate zone which would now correspond uh, with the band of uh, the Gobi Desert and other areas, but which may now be frigid. We know, for example, that when the Yukon breaks up in the spring and vast amounts of ice come down the Yukon and also breaking off of ancient uh, glaciers and so forth slip down into the sea at various points for all your living glaciers move and the ones who do not, which do not move are referred to as dead but moving or living glaciers are forever breaking off and causing icebergs and other similar structure. But frequently, these great glacial masses are filled with frozen tropical vegetation. The types of vegetation that you would normally expect in a climate more like Hawaii or Tahiti than anything we have in those areas. Some years ago in mining in the northern part of uh, Alaska, about as far north, not the farthest north, but as far north as Fairbanks, or even a little further north. Miners drilling found red dirt coming up out of the bits. After this red dirt, it had a little opportunity in the outside air. It was proved to not be dirt at all, but that as it melted, that it was the flesh of an animal, frozen solid. So they proceeded to dig out a very excellent old mastodon that at some remote time had been frozen in the deepest freeze in history. This animal, after having been thawed out, was in sufficiently good condition for some of the miners to try a steak or two. We are also not informed as to how digestible this was. But in the stomach of this frozen animal, was a partly digested meal of tropical ferns. Now we can't just talk this off. There has to be an explanation for it. And this explanation follows rather closely into the general belief of ancient peoples, including the very ones that Roy Chapman Andrews talked to, and who influenced his search in the Gobi area for various remains that what were called the great northern areas, the Polarian world, was once a magnificent garden world. Not due to the fact that the poles alternated and brought the equator to the pole or something of that nature, but due to the fact that what we call the encrustation of the poles with ice was a gradual process which could only occur after a long period of geological history. So it didn't begin that way, but only came to this degree when certain other changes resulted in the distribution of the various temperatures and climatic uh, areas of the earth. The same type of thinking 
reminds us that the Greeks, including Hesiod and other ancient ones among them, describe a race of beings called the Hyperboreans. The Hyperboreans, as their name implies, simply means above the winds or beyond the winds. The god Boreas was the god of the winds. And of course the word hypo uh, means exactly as we use it in connective form today. Thus we have a race of peoples living beyond the winds. These people, the Greeks believed, to have come from the north. That they actually were from beyond the point where the storms came from. Therefore their world was not stormy. Their world was a very beautiful one, filled with gardens and fountains and everything that was lush and beautiful. Yet they came from the extreme north, far beyond the abode of the winds. This again seems to be a legend tracing from some early structural change that took place in nature. But that such a land could have existed where now a snow waste stretches and the earth is seldom, if ever, unfrozen more than 12 inches below the surface. That such a land did exist, we know from the contents of the Mastodon's stomach, because he certainly didn't travel several thousand miles before he could digest a meal. Now some may think that he was frozen and drifted into his present location in deep freeze, but the direction of the drift would have had to bring him from a colder and colder spot. There is no way, apparently, that we know of in which any of these glacial sweeps could have been from the south to the north. Therefore, he had to have been frozen in an area which was cold when he started. And we have no knowledge of any reversal of this situation. So that it seems to be uh, almost inevitable that there was something in that region. While we know that the glacial period retired it did not retire by the glaciers moving north. It retired by the glaciers melting, leaving behind uh, the residue from themselves. Therefore, we have now two ancient peoples specified uh, by the Greeks and by the Hindus, the Polarian peoples and the Hyperborean. Now, such a distribution, as we have mentioned, probably did not limit itself to the human race or anything resembling it. It was probably part of the old legend of a paradise. In your old rabbinical law, we find a differentiation between the term paradise and Eden. In some ancient accounts, Eden is regarded as existing in one of the corners of paradise. Sometimes the order is reversed, but they are not identical. And it would appear that what the ancients were trying to tell us is that there was some kind of, a, of an ethereal world in which the garden of beauty existed, and that also there was a primordial paradise of some kind on earth that perhaps plays back to the legends of the Golden Age, that plays back to the infancy of man. Now, we do not assume that this paradise was a garden in which uh, a prototypic Adam and Eve of the pure Nordic, Nordic variety were wandering around without uh, very many clothes on. This paradise was in all probability a lush, uh, area in nature, a riot of life forms, gradually developing, and that it in all probabilities contained archetypally most of the forms of life that have since developed and distributed themselves around the earth. That they may well have moved downward, slowly, over periods of millions of years, following the lines of earth crystallization, taking by degrees uh, what land came into, existing, into existence, encroaching as wild growth encroaches on a deserted city, encroaching upon the uninhabitable until finally it was able to inhabit all of it. This creeping of growth is one of the most common things we notice in nature. 
cut out an opening in the clearing, in the jungle. Leave it, and in a month it is gone. Nature has closed over it again. You take machetes and you go down into the dry, thin jungle of Central America. The dry, bushy jungle of Yucatan. Only 10, 12, maybe 20 feet high at most. You take a machete and you cut a path through it, six feet wide and a mile long. And by the time you reach the end of the mile, there is no trace of the beginning of the path you cut. Everything closes in. And you cannot even find your way out again. You can say it's easy. Just follow the cut-off branches. You can't even find them. It has happened time and time again. All this happens by nature moving. And nature at the poles moving downward, relentlessly, with every available inch of land that could su support them. The same thing you see in Sicily, where you see life growing as near as it dares to grow to the very edge of the volcanic fields of Etna. You will find lava pool bubbling and a foot and a half away, a little plant trying to live. The moment this earth becomes capable, life moves into it. And according to the ancient belief, life moved inevitably until it covered. Moving from its first perilous foothold at the beginning of this area at the polar region. Here also, if this differentiation took place as we understand it, we can understand why it was held or believed that in the dawn of things, in that once upon a time land, which precedes all history and all serious accounts of everything, that the gods came down from their own exalted and mysterious abodes and took up their thrones upon this ancient land, that this was their first homeland on the earth. Now, we think, of course, of these gods as coming down, maybe like old Zeus with his thunderbolts, or Athena brandishing her spear, or something of that nature, but I doubt very much if that was what they originally intended. I think what they meant was that the gods were these over-orders of life, that in their pure and radiant state uh, dwelt in the spheres of light above and beyond matter but that these are the gods that descended and became men-formed, or took upon themselves matter. Thus descending into the shadows, descending into the darkness, and bestowing the orders of intelligence and consciousness according to the plan governing this procedure, that the gods truly took form and dwelt among us, and actually they were us that we in some mysterious way are part of that great order that moved in upon the ancient polar region of the earth. In your Indian mythology and in uh, other mythologies, uh, your great mountain Simuru, or the original archetypal Kalasa, the great mountain of the gods, was in the magnetic atmosphere at above the northern pole of the earth. Here also was the sacred, mysterious Shambhala, the Chang Shambhala of the north, of the Tibetan Buddhists, and even of the uh, Chinese Buddhists. Here was the imperishable land, the motherland, the place where all things are born and the place where all things will die. Here is the great root of the pilgrimage, which leads around the world and back again to the black sand of Gobi. It was a strange, almost fatalistic belief, reminding us of the great cycle of the Valsung in Nordic mythology. But these people firmly believed that this was true. And where else are we going to find an equally interesting, informative, and possible solution to some of these problems? For a long time we have suspected that humanity did come from Asia particularly from that area of Asia, which is north of India and south of Siberia. We have also had for a long time the conviction that man did not travel alone, that life moved with him. For at that time man was part of this life, 
and to visible minds and to visible eyes did they exist, there would be no difference between man and other forms of life. He would not be noticeably different. He might not even be a leader because very often those creatures with potential leadership are sluggards in the early, gra in the early degrees of their growth because they have too much potential work to accomplish. Their life is more complicated than creatures that mature more easily. Therefore, growth is slower. And as in the case of man, who as in his childhood is the most helpless of the animals. Also in this situation, assuming the possibility that all these creatures move together, we begin to wonder a little bit how the various forms of life developed. And here the beginning of environment can be traced. And we can perceive how environment and what we term heredity could have had a marked influence upon the shaping of the early world. We know, for example, that the environment of this first world was very different from ours. We know that the light of the sun as we see it today was unknown because the entire field of the planet was one mass of gases and mists and humidities through which light as we know it would not pass. Therefore, this was a world of the twilight, a world of almost impenetrable gloom. Under such conditions, you would have in these early manifestations very little of color. You would also have very little of sensory perception as we know it. We know the ancient Tibetan song about this. That in the beginning, these creatures had hard bones that softened and soft bones that hardened. A kind of a strange contradiction in itself, but in a wonderful way, summing up the whole mystery of evolution from uh, our way of looking at it. These creatures probably had very few sense perceptions, such as we understand. And of course, they undoubtedly began as one or monocell organisms. Their methods of generation are unknown. But we assume by recapitulating backwards through what is known that in the beginning these forms must have been of increasing duration. Duration or existence has always been one of the primary factors in the so-called growth of things. Duration, therefore, meant that probably these forms of life were wiped out almost immediately. And in that way, uh, many of them perished utterly. Gradually, the tenacity for survival and the gradual accommodation to the circumstances of environment, which changed much more slowly than these creatures, resulted in the development of a resisting organism an organism with greater and greater adaptability to the requirement of survival. The old legends tell us that this process went on until out of it was produced a practically immortal cell, a creature that was comparatively undying. In other words, it could have existed for a million years. This creature changed not at all having a complete sense of subsistence only about the thing that we would recognize most like it in our way of life would be a mineral which continues indefinitely yet is ultimately destructible. We also suspect that the mineral has consciousness although we are not aware of how to determine its degree of internal awareness that it is alive we deeply suspect. But this type of creature, attaining a, an indefinite continuance, violated a law of nature. Indefinite continuance was not its primary crime. Its primary crime was that in achieving it, it attained a static state of unchangeability. And therefore, gradually moved out of key to the fact that everything in nature was changing. Therefore, a division took place within this type of creature. And this division consisted of the challenge of change operating upon organisms. 
certain organisms, perhaps those most long established and most deeply crystallized, did not make the adjustment. Others did. And gradually, the element of change, survival by change rather than by continuance, resulted in a new type of adjustment between form and circumstances. Out of this type of development, we began to find the need for bodies that were capable of retaining continuously the resilience of change. The only answer to this is that there's only one thing that changes easily, and that is the young. When things continue too long, crystallization makes them comparatively impervious. Structures that have had an almost endless endurance become so set in their own endurance as to become uh, very difficult to move. And perhaps some of these primordial lives that have never changed belong to that type of life. Their continuance has become their death because they have been unable to escape from the forms they have built. Nature, not achieving her end in this way, gradually began to modify these forms to make it necessary that they change. And that the modification consisted in the gradual introduction of fission, in which a separation took place within organisms, and reproduction was by kind of division. Nature was therefore able to continually introduce new elements and create increase rather than to allow everything to remain unchanging. Here perhaps was the beginning of the population problem. But in any event, increase and change became essential. But nature, achieving her end, was again defeated. Having developed the concept of fission for reproduction, this fission continued until the vision brought life down to so minute a structure that it was gradually lost to objectivity because there was no growth of the divided parts. These divided parts simply divided and continued to divide and still continue to divide. And perhaps in this process of infinite division we have the origin of the minute microorganistic life that we know today. Nature was therefore compelled to move in again. And in this type of motion, she bestowed the power of the divided part to equal the original, introducing now the element of growth, by means of which each of the divided parts of the cell gained the full estate of the total cell producing two complete organisms where there had been previously only one organism. This achieved a certain purpose, but again, in the great course of ages, this purpose defeated itself. For in this purpose we had multiplication without change. We had the infinite propagation of the same kind of thing. Theoretically, could this have gone on forever, like some plasmic growth under laboratory technique, we could ultimately fill the world with these cells, but there would still be no essential change in them. Now all these processes are described in ancient writings uh, in a rather allegorical way. They are described very often as sort of experiments in a universal laboratory. And they are also taught in the form of kinds of life that have existed in the dawn of time and then vanished away forever, as in the uh, f uh, fantastic Chaldean history of Berossus. Here we have all this wild fantasy of generations. Nature continuing on its way was then in, found itself in the need to develop structures not only capable of infinite survival 
But in the course of survival, the specialization and differentiation of powers, of faculties. And nature accomplished this through the gradual diffusion of all available energy resources throughout these total organisms. So we have our original monocellular creature, which is to differentiate into almost any form of life that we know now. We have it a kind of common ground. Hypothetically and symbolically, it is a sphere. Although this sphere might be flattened out by circumstances, it had the, the archetypal general design of what we would call a raw egg. It had a central nucleus surrounded by a protoplasmic field. It had other elements within itself also, but these two are the ones which we hear the most about in old thinking. Now our amoebic proto, uh, progenitor, uh, like the amoeba of today, has comparative lack of organic structure, but this does not prevent it from playing many parts in its time. It is in a way one of the most universal geniuses of all creation. A man becoming proud or overbearing in his conceit should really study the amoeba. It is a most humiliating experience. He suddenly discovers that an amoeba does not have to have a stomach. It's all stomach. And then by changing its mind, it is no stomach. A most convenient state of affairs. If it gets tired of being a stomach, it becomes feet. It is proteus-like, capable of being all things to itself. Whatever it needs to be at the moment, that it is. It has no mouth because every part of its surface is a mouth. And when there is nothing in the mouth, there isn't any mouth, most convenient. <laughs> also, it has no brain. As far as we can tell, it has no nervous system. But every part of itself is acutely aware. Therefore, it, if any danger approaches any part of the amoeba, it is equally aware of it. With man, he can have a pretty serious injury to his foot before the impulse reaches his brain. Not so with the amoeba. He is completely sufficient to his own requirements. His uh, body becomes foot-like, therefore called pseudopodes. When he wants to travel, he doesn't have to hire a car or buy a ticket and something. All he has to do is move into himself. He just pushes a part of himself in front of himself and then moves the rest of himself into it. <laughs> he wears out no shoes and has no troubles of that nature. And all he has to do to travel is decide where he's going and gather himself around that point and he's there. <laughs> now in all probabilities, he is telling us really a very ancient archetypal story. He is telling us perhaps of the common field of sensory perception from which all sensory perception specialization as we know it originated. Within him perhaps is the core of the possibility of experiencing. And gradually out of this core the infinite diversity of specialized experience occurs. In him we have perhaps the dawning of function. And with the dawning of function, the dawning of need, we find that this being, because it is sensitive to many circumstances, which even man does not any longer recognize, it must also have been subjected to innumerable hazards. These hazards in turn requiring continually increasing adaptability for survival. So way back in those early days, we see the common creature whose various specializations we are going to trace in other forms of life. So perhaps our primordial beginning of man and of beast, of bird and of fish and of reptile, was this egg-like structure that was capable of being all that should ever come from it. Perhaps the outer membrane of this mysterious 
egg which the ancients held with such sacredness in practically every religion that we know. Perhaps this outer membrane was to become truly the outer part of man. Perhaps his skin, perhaps the whole of his epidermis, belongs to this ancient structure, infinitely refined, modified, and changed. Perhaps his arms and his legs move from this structure. But one thing we also gain from our ancient friends, and for which we have certain physical evidence today also, namely that man's sensory perceptions as we now know them were comparatively useless at the beginning because the world of things to be sensed was comparatively non-existent. Non -existent. We know that the fish in the deep caves of Kentucky are blind because there is nothing to see and that it is light and something to see that causes eyes. Yet these eyes are not merely the productions of things to see. They are the results of the seed of the capacity for that sensory perception being present on the inside. And we know that man's eyes came not from the surface inward, but came from the brain outward, originating within man as the necessity for them developed. Thus within this being is an infinite amount of potential adjustment. It can do these things. It can do anything that is necessary for its survival. And the only way that its survival can be actually blocked is when it destroys itself through certain misuse of rational powers. As long as it simply obeys, nature will supply it with everything that it requires. There may be a tremendous loss of lives in this procedure, but nature will ultimately come through and bring the type of thing that is necessary. So primordial man, not having the kind of world that we know, had his sensory perceptions for the most part locked within him, as his material body unfolded beyond that of the amoeba, and he came out of water and became a creature of land, and his surface um, substances hardened, and he was locked more and more into something that has been said to resemble a, uh, a kind of remote thing uh, resembling a mushroom or some kind of a creature of that nature. These faculties locked within him. The ancients said, what did this mean? Did it mean that he lacked contact with anything? And the opinion was, for the most part, that what we term this area of potential function locked within him, the rudiments which were to become sensory perceptions, the rudiments which were also to become emotion and mind, uh, uh, what uh, Buddha calls this machine of the six senses, the aggregates of which become involved in the creation of the objective personality, that all of this rested in a common sensory organ that was the first to appear, and according to uh, modern thinking, may be among the first things to appear even in the embryo. And that was a central eye, which was not a sight eye as we know it, but an area of sensitivity. And that this area of sensitivity was later to become what we call the pineal gland the mysterious ductless gland in the brain, the function of which is not yet very well known, and which we assume might possibly atrophy without serious loss, but which does not, and yet which we know to be composed of the same basic substances and materials as the optic nerve. This peculiar central organ of sight was not an organ of sight at that time as we know it. It must have been an organ of sensitivity, an organ which, as in certain primitive horn toads and in small fish in the australation area, still have a membrane over a rudimentary eye. 
And this membrane apparently is of such quality that light and darkness reactions may still be functioning within this eye, although visibility as we know it would not be. It is assumed that in these horn toads and fishes, uh, the third eye is still an organ of light-dark recognition. To our ancient forebears, this eye, which was called, the, of course, the all-seeing eye, or the eye of the mysteries, constituted in primitive man a link with a universe of causation. That man lived at that time in a kind of dream world. His body he was not really aware of, and he wasn't missing too much. It was a pretty helpless little mass of comparatively shapeless protoplasmic putty. What he was aware of, however, was a universe of energies around him. He was still inwardly aware of his own existence. He was aware of himself as a being apart from body. And he had at least a limited sensory perception remaining of the causal world from which he had descended, or of the substances of which his psychic life uh, was composed. This causal internal life awareness proceeded on with him until, as we are told in the old Hindu records, a gradual change began to take place. And that change was that this being, with the inward faculty awake, began to experience the phenomenon of going to sleep and dreaming that it was a bit of putty, dreaming that it was this protoplasm. It would periodically awake and rejoice that it was not this protoplasm, and be very thankful that this was only a bad dream. Perhaps. We don't know how thankful it was, but this is our general symbolic thinking as the ancients have told it to us. Until finally, in the course of time, the dream took over. And little by little, uh, the being became the thing it dreamed it was. It sank to sleep into the dream of being a little bit of putty. And putty became real, and everything else gradually disappeared. And the life of that being suddenly began to struggle in this putty. It, it found itself no longer remembering its own origin, but gradually feeling its way into existence like an unborn or newborn creature, struggling to understand something, and struggling to understand a world far less organized than ours. Now that the being should dream of being a body and then awaken and be a soul and continue this until the roles were transferred is not so different from our present state except the parts are exchanged. Man, living now in the material world and are oriented here, dreams that he lives in a better world. He dreams that he lives in a spiritual universe where wonderful and beautiful things can happen to him. Then he has extrasensory perception experiences and this world becomes more and more real and the material world becomes less and less real. Who knows? A million years from now? Five minutes from now? Ten million years from now? The dream may be reversed and man will suddenly realize once again that his dream life is the real life insofar as that dream life is better than the one he is living. If it is not, it is only an hallucination. But if it is a true life, someday he will dream and maybe he won't wake up again into matter, but will find the dream is the reality. This is the kind of thing that the legends tell us about. And it offers a wonderful world of looking through a looking glass like Alice and wondering what's on the other side. Actually, man continuing in his struggle it is said that the knowledge of the universal pattern, the knowledge of everything, by which he was consciously able to mold his own prospective body from the outside, his careful nurturing of these forms, so that they might sometime be a home for him. He was building them. 
Gradually, the role was reversed. Little by little, he went to sleep. He drank the waters of Lethe, and suddenly he woke up in this tiny, cramped little house with the first sensitivity perhaps to light and darkness, the feeling of fire close to him, the shudder of this organism trying to escape destruction. And finally, over great periods of time, this shudder, this struggle, resulting in the power to move. Little by little, all of the faculties of survival, which were locked within him, were drawn into manifestation. <coughs> by degrees, the inner sight, which he had lost, was compensated for by the growth of outer sight. And he began to see his world, and he began to struggle against his world. And in these periods also, according to the ancient accounts, there were terrible struggles of life. This was the time of prehistoric creatures. And this, we are told, is the day when there were giants upon the earth. And they fought and struggled like the titans of Greek mythology. And life destroyed life, and form devoured form. And finally, in the great ages that follow, nature subsided this struggle. Nature gradually destroyed these forms that were no longer capable of advancing in a line of reasonable development. And in the course of ages, the next miracle occurred. The miracle which was to affect the whole future life of the human race. And that was the gradual individualization of the power of mind. Now mind is a very extraordinary thing. And Besorus tells us, and the ancients are of that opinion, that mind requires more life, more of life, for its maintenance than the body does. It also requires a kind of essence drawn out of all physical things to sustain the brain through the instrument of which this mind is going to function. Therefore, the development of brain-mind relationships immediately produced an effect. The ancient legends of the mindless who went to sleep in the dark of the dawn and never woke again. The mindless perished when the mind came because that which was mindless could not survive against mind. But mind had many parts and divisions to it. Uh, recent researches in the last 25 or 30 years in India, for example, have indicated on a scientific level that there is no reason to think that a carrot doesn't have a mind. We are not accustomed to it, and we hate to think that it, we are grinding up a mind for our salad. But actually, we have no proof that the carrot does not think or feel placed upon delicate electrical measuring instruments that measure minute energy impulses. A carrot approached by the point of a sharp instrument will draw back before that point touches it. The drawing back is so slight that we could never see it. But it tells us that it's quite conceivable that that carrot, like everything else, wants to live. It's an amazing thing. We haven't thought of living in a universe of life. We have thought of being alive in a universe of things that do not matter. And this has been a basic mistake for which we must sometime uh, find a proper solution. But we know that mind was not limited entirely to man. Other creatures began to develop it. And most of the phenomena that we see around us today, even in the lesser kingdoms, the magnificence of motion, of color, of coordination, of instinct, sensory perceptions, in which many animals greatly excel ourselves. All of these are part partial or donal developments of mind in various forms and various conditions. But out of these things rose man as mind. And the moment he began to toy with mind, he found that his other energies were no longer as important to him as he thought they were going to be. The need for the energy for the brain processes and to fulfill the innumerable area of activities which the brain consistently and continuously released resulted in the major modification in the form of man. The age of primitive 
giants, of monsters, and of prehistoric animals passed in limbo because brain required the energy that had previously formed these chaotic bodies. The, the great prehistoric mammal with an enormous body and an insignificant brain did not survive. Forms reduced in size gradually integrated more closely and began to develop purposefully and specially only such instruments and such powers as were useful or necessary in the unfoldment of the mental life of the individual. <coughs> this was true of most of the so-called advanced animals. In fact, all animals as we know them now. As this continued to proceed, we find another important situation arising. Studies of primitive life reveal to us that with almost certain certainty the primordial forms of life were hermaphroditic. They were creatures, male, female, or positive, negative in their own structure. Small examples of this type of life still survive in nature as normal creatures. Uh, undoubtedly, in the beginning, reproduction was of this nature. The development, however, of the psychic, mental, and emotional polarities seemed to have resulted in the need for the division of the reproductive power of man, so that gradually uh, the energies required to sustain generation and mentation were divided. And the, this division resulted in polarized life. Now it was with the establishment of polarized life based upon the activity of a mental agent functioning within the unfolding organism which was gradually building a symbolic structure appropriate to the expression of its internal requirements and intentions that we have the dawn of man as we recognize him today. And in this dawn of man we have what the ancient peoples referred to as the Lemurian being. The Lemurian being actually passing from a pre-Adamite to an Adamite condition by the division of its reproductive polarity and the establishment within itself of the cerebrospinal nervous system. From that time on, the story of man is the story of his growth. It is the story of the continuous unfolding of the powers, principles, and energies within him. And of course, that is to be the subject of further discussion. And now that we've gotten him to this elegant condition of existence, I think we'll let him rest there until next week. <laughs>